Hi, it's Dave. I hope you had a good weekend. In the past few days, the Tesla community has learned of news of a new refreshed version of the Model 3 that's being made in Fremont as we speak. In this video, I'm going to dig a bit deeper into this in three parts. First, I'll share what the Model 3 refresh is and some concerns for Tesla. Second, I'll share a clip from a viewer. And then third, I'll share a conversation I had about the Model 3 refresh with Omar from Whole Mars Blog, who played an interesting role in this leak. All right, let's first take a look at some of the pictures of the new refreshed Model 3 that was leaked just a few days ago. This first picture, you'll see the handle in the front passenger side, it's black, it's blacked out, and you'll see this white tape around the other handle. And so you'll see that this is one of the major changes that the exterior trim is now blacked out on the Model 3, just like the Model uh, Y is right now. All right, next you'll see a picture of the center console, and this center console is different. I'll show you a couple more pictures. The manufacture date of this vehicle is October 8th, 2020, and it says new process. So this is kind of the new refreshed Model 3 that's just being made out of the Fremont factory. Next you see in the rear, there's a black trim around the rear window, and the other part of the trim is covered with white tape. All right, here's a picture of the interior of the Model 3. The person who took the picture says that he thinks the computer might be a little bit different, but I don't know, it looks it's pretty similar to me. And here is now the center console. So this is another picture that's been leaked by another person, and you'll see that it's kind of, before it was this piano glossy black, and now they've changed it, and it looks actually fantastic. I, I love this look. They got rid of the, um, the folding cover on top of the phone in the charger as well. And here you'll see the difference between the old Model 3 center console on the left with this shiny black, and on the right is the new center console, and I think it looks fabulous. All right, let's take a look at what this Model 3 refresh is and what it means. First, Tesla has blacked out the exterior trim, right? The trim around the windows, the door handles, etc. It has changed the center console to a new design and has added a power trunk. And this is probably the most significant one, but it's possible that Tesla's added a heat pump that the Model Y has, which gives it extra range. And we'll see how much and how long perhaps this new Model 3 refresh will go. And this refreshed version of the Model 3 is now shipping to Europe. Tesla usually batch produces their vehicles early in the quarter for Europe, so they have enough time to ship it on the boats to get there. And then later in the quarter, they make cars for the East Coast, and then finally they make cars for the West Coast. And so I expect to see this refreshed Model 3 selling in the U.S. probably by late November at the latest. All right, I want to cover some Osborne risks. So the Osborne effect or risk is when you promote features in a future vehicle, right, a, a vehicle that's coming later, that can decimate the sales of your current products because people kind of get into the habit of just wanting to wait to get the better product later. And the risk of this is your revenue dries up because people are waiting for a new product. I, regarding the current Model 3 refresh that we're seeing here, I think it's relatively minor because it's mostly cosmetic. Um, changes. However, there is that heat pump change which could lead to an increase in range. And so this could cause some issues because Tesla needs to sell their current inventory of Model 3 cars. Luckily, I don't think Tesla has a ton of inventory and they can probably sell the cars relatively easy in the month of October. Overall though, I think a general rule that Tesla tries to follow is they try to make all of their changes gradual so to avoid the Osborne effect. In other words, rather than having these amazing changes and people then regretting, right, just buying the Model 3 right before the change, Tesla likes to make gradual changes like every month and make the car better over time. And this has been a huge, not just priority, but strategy for Tesla in trying to avoid this Osborne effect. Now the Model S and X are in deep need of a refresh and it's going to be a challenging time or challenging effort to refresh the Model S and X because it's difficult do, to do a gradual interior and structural change to a vehicle like the Model S and X. Like so much needs to change. And so Tesla I think needs to navigate this carefully and they need to be really secretive to not let the leak out, like what the new Model S and X looks like, what the features, the range of performance, etc., and when it's gonna be uh, released. And so Tesla needs to be ultra secretive. And I think this is 
sets the stage where Tesla in the coming years will become a more secretive company than even Apple because so much is at stake with Tesla keeping their future products secret because that preserves the sales of their current product. All right, next I wanna show a video from a viewer who had an interesting idea on how to perhaps avoid the Osborne effect for this refresh Model 3. This video comes from a live Zoom event that I announced on Twitter just a couple days ago. Check it out. Wouldn't it make sense to increase the price of the European uh, uh, or the, yeah, the European model, because if it's getting the new batteries, uh, if it's getting the better tech, probably will be lighter as well because of the uh, new body. Um, why not just make, raise the price and avoid any issues? Yeah, I mean, um, that's actually a, a great strategy too that Tesla has done in the past. Like if a new version of the of the Model S with, let's say, when they did the 100D, you know, version um, of the Model S next, they raised the price. They basically said, hey, this is a premium product. It goes further. Therefore, it's like 10,000 more. And so, yeah, they could um, raise the price of the Model 3 in Europe because we know that these Model 3s are being shipped right now, you know, the refreshed ones to Europe. They likely have a higher range, you know, and maybe some other features. So, I mean, Tesla could say, hey, these are what, $5,000 more, they get 25 miles more of range. And then maybe that could, you know, make people who have the old model, model three feel better that they're like, oh, okay, I got a good deal with my older model three. And then the people who get the new model three, they're like, Hey, like I want the best and the latest, you know? Um, so yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, Tesla definitely can do that. Um, and it raises some revenue for them too, you know? Um, I mean, that's one way. The other way I was thinking is, they just kind of like downplay it, you know, saying, hey, it's not that big of a refresh. You know, it's like, who cares? It's just tiny bit of refresh, uh, just the trim and stuff and say the range is the same, you know? And then over time, over the next quarter or two, they could say, hey, look, um, the range is magically five miles or 10 miles better in the next quarter, you know, another five or 10 miles and, and stuff like that. That's another approach. Um, but I'm sure like Tesla thinks about this very deeply. You know, it's like very, very challenging. I don't know, what are your thoughts, Michael? I was more concerned about the model Y because that's going to be a huge leap. The the trim, the uh, I don't know about the model three, but uh, it sounds like uh, if you're going to get it and you're itching to get it, you're going to get it. If, if you weren't itching to get it, you might wait a little bit. Uh, so, you know, there might be uh, less, um, less effect than, uh, than we might be maybe are thinking. Yeah. yeah. What, what country are you in right now? Uh, Czech Republic. Czech uh, is, is Tesla is is Tesla in Czech Republic right now? No, not I yet. tried to buy the merge. No, not yet. <laughs> got it, got it. And what got you interested in Tesla out there? Um, the stock. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been eyeing the company for a while. It hasn't done much, uh, but when the Model Three came out, out it definitely uh, caught my attention because of the. Um, it seemed like it's like the make or break moment. And it seemed that uh, the Model 3 was finally the uh, mass produced car that could uh, mm -hmm. take the market. And it did. Mm -hmm. Got it. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate your question and just chatting. All right, for part three of my video, I want to introduce a conversation I had with Omar from Whole Mars Blog. He runs a Twitter account and also a blog where he talks about Tesla and EV news. And I wanted to talk to him because he kind of played an interesting role in this Model 3 refresh leak. And I wanted to get his thoughts on it. Dude, I'm a software engineer. Yeah. So I just started kind of writing about this stuff. I'm curious for the Model 3 refresh. So Electric comes out with their article, was it Thursday or Friday? Right, yeah. Or um, something it was around uh, there, right? something something around that time, right? Yeah, and then they it was probably during the mid or morning or midday, and then they're saying, "Hey, the refresh is coming, but we don't have pictures because we need to protect our sources." <laughs> and you read that, so what goes through your head, and what happens from there? Right. So you know, we'd been hearing about this potential for some changes to the Model Three for some time. Obviously, with the Model Y you had the black trim rather than the chrome trim on the Model 3. And you had other changes like the heat pump and the castings that actually gave the Model Y a pretty similar range to the 3, even though it's a much bigger car. Mm -hmm. So naturally, people were asking, okay, at some point these changes have to come down to the Model 3 as well. 
And when are we going to see that? And what's it going to look like? What form is it going to take? Mm -hmm. So there had been some talk about that. And I think, you know, Drive Tesla Canada had shown some pictures of new headlights and some new stuff. But then uh, Electric wrote the story and they said, okay, there is this uh, Model 3 coming. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the week before on Friday, somebody had uh, caught a screenshot of the parts catalog saying uh, new you know, HVAC system use after October 5th. So there were some mm -hmm. clues. Mm -hmm. um, but then definitely when the electric article came out, obviously, you know, huge site that, you know, lots of people read. So mm -hmm. then people really started thinking about it. So me and a friend of mine, we ha we happened to be at uh, La Victoria Taqueria in Hayward mm -hmm. having dinner when we saw somebody post a picture of this Model 3 with black trim. So we said, okay, you know, there's clearly something going on here. They said they saw this at Fremont. You know, we're not that far away. Why don't we go, just go to Fremont and just see what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and we joke, maybe we'll hop over the fence or something, go look at one of the cars. So we went to the Fremont South logistics lot and there were just a ton of cars there. I mean, it looked like an end of quarter rush type situation. I don't know if that was normal. You know, I don't go to Fremont every week, but mm -hmm. there were a lot of cars, a lot of activity, cars being loaded onto car carriers, tons of car carriers showing up. And it was it was hard to tell because obviously there was a fence and we didn't want to trespass onto, you know, Tesla property or anything like that. But we could kind of see from far away that there was some white uh, shipping tape covering the trim and stuff like that and a few clues to suggest that these might be the new cars but we really couldn't get close enough to see when the cars were leaving we said okay i think there's some black trim there we really couldn't get close enough to see and then we said hey let's go take a look at the cell production line on cato road where tesla held the battery day uh, which we went to a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. and we went there and took a look it was like running 10 o'clock at night uh, all the lights were on there were tons of employees there so that was interesting and then we said okay let's go home so we start driving back to the freeway to go home and as mm -hmm. we're driving we see a car carrier full of cars going the other direction past us and we look really quickly to the side and the cars have the black trim on them mm -hmm. and we said oh there they are those are the cars Let's follow them. So, this, <laughs> so we turned around. So those cars, they didn't have the white tape on them? They did have the white tape on them, but the back area, there was a back area that didn't have tape on it, Got and it. you could see the black trim. Okay. So we said, okay, these are the new cars. Let's follow them. And we followed them, and amazingly enough, this truck pulled to the side of the road somewhere just on the street, and there was another truck not too far away from that with no driver, and just a bunch of cars manufactured that day sitting there. Mm -hmm. So we said, wow, I can't believe it. And we went and snapped some pictures of the black trim, the new center console, which uh, has been, you know, kind of had some mixed reactions based on the mm -hmm. first photo people have seen. Mm -hmm. You were um, saying, and, you, were, you tweeted that you were like shaking when you found <laughs> it, like what was going through your mind at the moment? Well, it was just a little bit surprising because, you know, we knew there were these new Model 3s I'm in the market to buy one pretty soon. So I had a personal interest in it as well. And we knew that these cars were there in the shipping lot, but we couldn't really see them. And it was just really surprising that we actually found a car carrier full of these unattended and we could just simply walk up and go look at it after, you know, we thought, okay, it's time to go home. And we kind of got lucky and just spotted these trucks. So it was just kind of a surprising moment. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then shortly after that, then I guess um, more pictures got leaked of, I guess, the center console the next day. And um, pretty much everyone uh, knows mm -hmm. about now the refreshed mm -hmm. Model 3. I mean, what's your opinion? So these are being made, I'm guessing, right mm -hmm. after the quarter you know, ended. And then they're being shipped to Europe, I'm guessing, in this first batch overseas, probably all of October's, you know, or a good chunk of it, right, is going to be shipped overseas. Um, what do you think? Are they going to, are they going to charge more for this refresh Model Three? You think so that the people who have the previous 
unrefreshed model don't feel as bad about their purchase? Mm -hmm. Or do you think they will downplay this refresh by saying, it's not a big refresh, it's just some trim and the range is the same for now. And then gradually increase the range over, you know, Mm -hmm. the next few quarters as, you know, to make it less of a shock. What do you think? Well, I think that they are going to just switch over. They're not going to have two production processes. There was a sticker on the car that said new process. So I think this is the new process going forward. You know, only really hardcore Tesla enthusiasts, I think, will even really be able to, you know, notice the difference. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's essentially the same thing. Sure, sure. Um, it seems bet it seems better in a lot of ways once you think about it. But mm-hmm. if you have the old one, you know, it's still just as good. Most people, I think, put a vinyl wrap over theirs to protect it. Um, but really, it, it fu- it's functionally pretty much the same thing. It's kind of a minor design iteration. The only reason that people are so excited about it is it's the first time the car's really changed in three years. Sure, sure. I mean, exterior wise, it's like the same, except for the mm-hmm. blacked out trim, right? And then right, yeah. interior wise, you have the new center console, you have a power lift gate, um, mm-hmm. you have some, I guess, change in fabric kind of in some places. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is that about it? Is there anything else? Yeah, and I think possibly a uh, heat pump um uh-huh. that makes it uh work better in cold weather while which, using less energy for the hvac exactly which, um, the big which is probably the biggest um improvement of them all right i mean that would be the biggest thing i think people are wondering is yeah. does this all affect the range because yeah. if it does then that's a big deal um yeah. if not it's just cosmetic sure i mean for those who are enthusiastically following tesla and understand you know mm-hmm that the heat pump has made a big difference in the Model Y range, it's uh, fairly obvious, you know, that this heat pump is going to help the Model 3. Um, I mm-hmm. mean, do you think Tesla just, like, when they start ship, when they start delivering it in Europe, will they actually share the new range if it's higher at that moment? Or do you think they'll downplay the range improvements? Yeah, I think they'll definitely want to talk it up. I mean, you mm-hmm. see that some of the close competitors to the Model 3, like, for example, the Polestar 2, yeah. are coming in at 233 miles of range EPA. Uh, I think with the new design, it's possible they could be doing 100 more miles at the same price point. So definitely that matters competitively. Yeah. And I think they'll keep the price the same and that this will unify the Model 3 and Model Y production processes somewhat. Uh, keep the production processes more similar and share costs between the three and the Y. So it may actually reduce Tesla's production cost just Mm -hmm. by putting everything on the same supply chain in terms of the black trim and the heat pump and all those things. So, you know, they can place larger orders for the heat pump and the black trim. And rather than having to have two processes and two production lines, the same production line for the parts can just be used for both cars all over the world. Um, So there's potentially some benefits there. So, I mean, what do you think about, you know, the whole Osborne effect or risk on Tesla? So here they have this new refresh Model 3. It possibly can, you know, have a longer range. And then if it's the same price, people who just picked up their Model 3 might feel kind of like, oh, man, like Mm -hmm. an older version, less range, et cetera, for the same price. I mean, like, is this something that discourages people from like, just, you know, purchasing Tesla products until like, will people be waiting for a refresh, you know, like, for example, with the Model S and Model X, right, Mm -hmm. everyone knows that, you know, refreshes do soon. So Mm -hmm. I mean, if there is like a leak with the Model S and X, let's say people know exactly what the specs are, or the look, etc. Are people going to just stop buying the Model S and X, you know, until it comes out? Or I mean, how do you how, what do you how do you think about this? Well, Tesla is very different than other companies because with other companies, you traditionally have a fixed product refresh cycle where every year, maybe every three years, they'll roll all the changes into one update. Tesla can make, according to Sandy Monroe, one of his 
recent videos, 12, 13 changes in a three month span. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about potentially changes every week into the production process. And the fact of the matter is the Tesla that comes out after the Tesla you buy is always going to be better. You know, Tesla can make 12, 13 changes in a single quarter, just little changes that most people wouldn't even notice. But they're constantly iterating on their products, and that's very different than most of the auto industry. So especially with battery day, you're going to see this actually increase where the new Teslas are dramatically better at a dramatically lower cost than the previous Teslas. So there's always going to be something new. If you wait longer, yeah. you can get a better product, especially when things are improving so fast. Yeah. But nobody who buys the car uh, is really going to be unhappy, yeah. I think. I thought like um, for the current Model S and X, like, you know how the Model S is like 400 mile range. I feel like mm -hmm. Tesla did the like the right thing in which they've kind of just gradually increased the range where it's like before you know it, it's like 400. It's like they do it so like retroactively like, uh, oh, you know, mm -hmm. the range has been increased. You know, we did it a few months ago or something, you know, by a little right, bit, a right. little bit, a little bit. So nobody like it's kind of like you know, what is it? Boiling the frog slow, slowly, right? <laughs> it's like no one feels the change, you know? I feel like yeah. I feel like that's the right approach in a way. Like just do it like retroactively, do it so slowly, like small changes. But then there are times when you can't avoid the, 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 the changes, you know? And it's like, for example, the next generation Model S and X is going to be a huge change, you know? So you can't right. like, do certain things gradually. So, I mean, those, like I would imagine Tesla is like, becoming in some ways they have to become super secretive with mm -hmm. their new products because it's like existential in some ways to them to right. keep the lid on it you know like more secretive than even apple was you know in the heyday definitely um, definitely what do, you, what do you think about that like that idea well just by the nature of these products when you have cars they're going to last several times longer than your phone the replacement cycle is several times longer so it's really even a much bigger issue than it was for Apple, um, if you think about it. But at the same time, um, that's why they really don't talk about these things at all. They'll do little software updates or little improvements to design of the car to reduce weight without necessarily even making the battery pack bigger. Mm -hmm. And that's been really interesting. So... I think that you'll continue to see little iterative improvements in addition to the new batteries, which are going to have 56% more range. You're going to see the old Panasonic cells also be upgraded to get 10 to 20% more range. You're going to see the car continue to be improved. So I think there will be little incremental improvements that will actually let them get a lot of value out of the old investments they have in, for example, the Gigafactory and that kind of thing. And I think you'll see the Model 3's range continue to uh, rise gradually even before they start putting the new cells in there. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, you know, there's a benefit to the fact that there's a huge divide between what the mainstream buying public, you know, your your, your aunt who, you know, is a dentist and has a life versus what the hardcore Tesla fans uh, may know. So will, will it really affect uh, sales? Maybe, but the thing is, electric vehicle sales are just growing so much naturally, especially as battery costs fall, mm -hmm. that they can't really uh, mess up. And there's always going to be something new. So Come I on. would always encourage people to just buy. Yeah. Um, you asked elon on twitter about like when will they uh put, like what will berlin factory like you know what cells will they use will they use 4680 or 2170 etc and he replied that they're going to be using 4680 um and you're kind of surprised like what was your reaction what does that mean to you you know why did you ask, ask that right, question right. and you know what's going on so the battery day presentation was something that Elon really got everyone very hyped about. 
And then when he delivered the presentation, most people didn't really understand it. It kind of went over their heads. And I don't know if that was accidental or on purpose, but people, it was a lot of numbers, right? And I mean, people don't even understand, you know, kilowatts versus kilowatt hours. Understanding the minute details of battery cell production and how that impacts output is not something that the average person is going to understand. And it almost seems like they tried to downplay all of this on purpose for exactly the reason that you were mentioning. If people know that there's going to be a dramatically better car right around the corner, why would they buy a car today, right? And we need to sell cars today to keep the lights on. So in the presentation, it seems pretty clear that they tried to make this all sound much further away than it actually is. Like, okay, we've got this new cell, but, you know, it's really just in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Well, then you listen to all the details. And Elon made a comment in Berlin where he said, oh, you know, this new car is going to have a new battery pack, et cetera, et cetera. There were some clues. If you listen very, very carefully that this technology is actually much further along than they would have you believe. And so that's why I kept asking him mm -hmm. maybe 20, 40 times about Berlin. <laughs> and yeah. finally he answered. You know, I think mm -hmm. someone actually said like, oh, he's not going to answer this. And yeah. sometimes when people say that, that's when he decides to answer. But <laughs> He finally said, okay, yeah, you, you know, what people are suspecting is right. The Berlin factory under construction right now, it's going to make Model Y with the 4680 cells. Mm -hmm. And we now know based on on permits that Austin is going to be making these cells too mm -hmm. for Cybertruck and Semi. Mm -hmm. So this is not like some science product. Mm -hmm. This is like, this is going into production now in Berlin and Cybertruck. And as soon as those factories are ready, the cars coming off the line are going to have these new cells, which require 69% less capex, mm -hmm. the machines you need to build the cells, 70% of the cost gone, a mm -hmm. huge reduction in footprint, 54% range increase at 56% less cost. I mean, this is just enormous. People mm -hmm. had always speculated that a hundred dollars a kilowatt hour was the price level needed where an electric vehicle could achieve sticker price parity with a gas car. I'm not talking about the fuel savings or the maintenance. I'm just talking about what you pay out of the dealership. What's your car payment? A hundred dollars per kilowatt is what they needed. Now, Sandy Monroe thinks that the Model Y battery pack is at $108 a kilowatt hour at the pack level, which would make a 56% reduction, $48. Hmm. So you know, Tesla was kind of opaque with this. They said, yeah. we reduced by 56%. Well, you don't know necessarily where they are, so they didn't give you a hard number. But if they're anywhere close to where people are predicting in the 48 to $70 range, they didn't just meet the goal. They smashed through it. And this battery going into production is world history, if this is really all true. Mm -hmm. So that's why... The sales going into production in Berlin was really significant and really eye-opening to people who yeah. understand the details of this stuff. Yeah, like for me, I I mean, I was like, wow. I mean, that's big news because it's like Berlin is slated, according to rumors, to start production. Let's say June of next year. Um, it could be right. even it could be even earlier, but you know, supposedly hiring a couple months before. But let's say we we take June of next year, that's just right around the corner, right around the corner. And then the other thing is, it doesn't make sense to build a whole factory and for the first six months of opening production to like have limited production because you're still trying to figure out how to make cells for the cars. Like in order to build a factory and to say we're gonna build Model Y first here. Mm. Um, you got to be pretty confident. And if you're going to do 4680 cells, these new cells, you got to be pretty confident in your production ability to ramp yes. up those cells at a very fast pace to keep up with production because that's going to be the constraint. 
you know, is these probably 48 cells, 46, 80 cells. But if it's so still yet experimental, if there's still so many mm -hmm. problems to, you know, worked out, then you probably wouldn't trust like mm -hmm. the whole entire factory's battery cell production, you know, the biggest constraint on that experimental technology, you know what I'm saying? Like you've got to have some, yeah. you got to have some confidence that this is ready or, you know, to go, you're, you're ready to scale it. You're ready mm -hmm. to like ramp up with the factory in Berlin. Um, and that's what surprised me about it. I'm like, whoa, right. like, this is actually like, um, this is pretty right. serious stuff, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at the difference between what they say and what they do. I mean, mm -hmm. at the presentation, Elon was like, well, you know, it doesn't really work yet. Exactly. Yeah. The, the yield is low, but it's like, okay, well, the yield is always low on any new production process. Yield being the amount of cells coming out that actually work. Right. Yeah. So if the yield is low, you don't want to produce too many because you'll make a bunch of junk um, and have to throw it away. So you want to improve the yield first before you ramp up production, which is normal. Any new production process has low yield. But he made it seem, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, he made this presentation. It doesn't even work. Yeah. Well, look at what they say and look at what they do. They may yeah, be yeah. trying to tell you it doesn't work and it's far away, but they're building two factories right now. <laughs> Exactly. And all the cars coming out of these factories are going to use the new cells. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the that's the point. Meaning like, OK, Austin is supposed to be what? Cybertruck and semi. Right. And right. perhaps also later model Y I and mean, model three for East Coast. But the focus is trying to get Cybertruck by the end of the year. Right. And also semi. So you're like, we know that's 4680 cells. They can't use anything else. Right. Right. And that everything is dependent on them getting these cells up and running and the whole factory how can they even make anything if they don't have the cells right mm -hmm. like yep. you've got to be pretty confident you're gonna <laughs> make a ton of cells in order to build this huge factory right to start production it's just yeah it's interesting definitely stuff. i think you hit the nail on the head there and it's not only cybertruck and semi mm -hmm. but berlin y with close to 500 miles i mean it almost defies belief Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you've got the 4680 line at Fremont, which is going to be used for the Plaid Model S and Roadster. Mm -hmm. So you've got all these vehicles in the pipeline with these new cells. And the really amazing thing is that with just one or two cell lines with the new cell process, yeah. you can get the same output as 14 cell lines at Gigafactory mm -hmm. Nevada. So yeah. it's just amazing how small it is and how many vehicles you can produce and Fremont has traditionally had to ship batteries in from Nevada from the gigafactory to make their yeah. cars well now you're looking at Model S actually being able to make the cells on site at Fremont mm -hmm. previously you needed the whole gigafactory for that now you can do it right at Fremont at NUMI and same thing with the other uh, factories in Berlin in Austin it's going to use a lot less space I mean before it would have taken up so much space to produce all the cells they needed that it would have been basically impossible to make millions of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a real possibility. And they're pushing hard on this. I think the fact that they're building so many factories, it did kind of seem almost excessive at, for a time. It was like, why are they building so many factories? Mm -hmm. Now it makes sense. Now yeah. it makes sense why they're building all these factories. Yeah, and if you think about it, like this stuff has been planned for many years. You know, if you look at, for example, the Cybertruck, that whole Cybertruck was built around the 4680 cell. You know, and mm -hmm. this isn't something 100%. new. Yeah, this isn't something new that they came up with. You know, I mean, this is the design, the whole chemistry, the whole production system. This they've been working on it for a long time, and they have their timeline and roadmap on when they can produce this and scale it, etc. And everything was matched, in my opinion, with the Cybertruck by the end of, you know, 2021, yeah. to get the 4680 mm -hmm. cells up and running. Um, I had this interesting thought the other day, um, when the stock price was like, you know, like hurting last year. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and Elon, you know, went um, with his autonomy day presentation. Like, I would imagine in some ways, like it took a lot of dis self discipline and restraint for, for him to like not spill the beans on 
battery production or you know mm -hmm. this is a lot of stuff that tesla is doing and the stock price is kind of languishing and yet you know he just bites his tongue and, mm -hmm. and he does focus on autonomy and its potential which is huge but on the battery mm -hmm. side for so many years for elon to bite his tongue until battery day you know it's just um <laughs> it's really interesting yeah definitely um and i think that you're very right. And it was very hard for him to bite his tongue, which is why you saw him drop a couple of hints. Even at autonomy day, he referenced the million mile battery mm -hmm. and um, that, you know, ba stronger batteries are an essential part of their autonomy strategy, too. But really, I think definitely you're right with the Cybertruck reveal. When they unveiled that $40,000 price point, mm -hmm. that was the big shocker of the event. Exactly. When people said, how can you deliver this car, I mean, this truck that is at the same price as a Model 3, and yet it's bigger, it must have a bigger battery, and yet it's the same price. And exactly. 4680 was the key to that. And I think you can actually trace it back to the Roadster and Semi reveal, because people were just like, holy cow, how are you getting these battery specs? Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't possible with today's battery technology. And we now know that, you know, these vehicles are using the new 4680 cells. So I think that was when they first thought that it was a realistic possibility. So this mm -hmm. has to go back at least five years, this effort. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's definitely hit some snags along the way. I think they were yeah. planning to ship the Plaid Model S um, this year, by the end of this year. They had to push it back to the end of next year. So I think definitely the pandemic and technical issues pushed it back at least a year, maybe more. Um, but it seems like, you know, I mean, this is pretty, pretty typical with Tesla. Yeah. Delayed, but they're on it. Yeah. And it seems like they're getting close now. Yeah. Like I, I remember around autonomy day, like Elon's like, hey, we're going to have to have another one of these events. You know, for battery mm -hmm. and drivetrain, and um, later on in the year, or something, or toward or the beginning of next year. So that means in autonomy day, things were rolling fast mm -hmm. with battery. I mean, this stuff was, you know, going on quickly enough for right. Elon to say, "Hey, you know, maybe early next year we can, you know, show off, show off some stuff." And you know, it got extended another six months or so to right. you know September. So that's been quite a while from autonomy mm -hmm. day, you know, a, a year and a half for Tesla to have right. a lot of stuff going on. I mean, it's like when I looked at Cybertruck reveal, I'm like, my first thought was, whoa, this is this, that was battery day part one, in my opinion. Right. You're yeah. saying, you're saying, hey, we have revolutionary battery breakthroughs, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Um, right. Otherwise, none of that is possible. Mm -hmm. um, so Definitely. yeah, yeah. So the whole battery day was battery day part two in a way. It's like how we're doing it, how we're making these huge leaps in range, efficiency, cost, etc. Um, another interesting thing is like, you know, people know or hit Elon's public persona is kind of like taken to be like to um, over exaggerate, over promise mm -hmm. on timelines, right? Mm hmm. And that's why I think it's so difficult for people to ex or to digest that Tesla perhaps is actually moving faster than people realize, you know, because mm -hmm. they're used to the whole public p promises of full self-driving by a certain date, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what people are missing is like, there are two types of timelines. One timeline is it doesn't affect your current sales of current products, has no Osborne effect. Mm -hmm. For example, full self-driving when it comes like, it doesn't really change mm -hmm. like your demand for your product. In fact, if you give an aggressive timeline, timeline, it can help the sales of your product. You know, there's not really mm -hmm. an Osborne effect with mm -hmm. Elon saying, oh, we're doing a cross country, you know, hands free mm -hmm. drive or something, right, right. you know, 2007 or whenever it was. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But there, it's different um, when you look at like battery production, um, like range improvements cost mm -hmm. of vehicle etc this stuff i i think elon is much more sensitive he's much mm -hmm. more in tune with the impact to hurt current sales of current products so much so that he will go to the extreme of protecting you know his sales which he should do as a ceo right mm -hmm. um 
but it seems like so different or it seems so different right. to people. They don't understand like, wait a minute. I thought he's an over promissory, you know, like how can mm -hmm. they really be sandbagging? I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, Steve Jobs had a great quote once back when Apple was running into some trouble and he was talking at WWDC or something like that. And he said, you know, sometimes people treat you like you were 18 months ago. And it takes them some time to realize that you've actually changed in some ways. And they're still treating you just like you were 18 months ago without it, without realizing it yet. And I think that the Model 3 production process was extremely painful for them in many ways. They made some big promises and it took several years longer than they said. Now, I think it actually kind of worked out well because originally they said the goal was 500,000 vehicles in 2020. Then they moved it up to 2018. Mm -hmm. They ended up missing that by about two years, but they ended up kind of back where they originally started. So mm -hmm. there's something to be said for these aggressive deadlines, but it was definitely embarrassing to their credibility. You know, it became a big joke like, where's the Model 3? They can't ramp production. Now, when you saw the next vehicle, the Model Y, the story was a lot different. Mm -hmm. They promised to ship it in the fall. They ended up shipping it in Q1 instead of Q3. So, and when you look at Gigafactory Shanghai, they exceeded what anyone could have possibly imagined. People were like, you're going to build this factory in a year? That's crazy. You know, I think they did it in, what, like nine, ten months mm -hmm. from... A, from dirt to production and they're getting better and faster at building these factories and they've learned mass production in a way that they just didn't understand before as a company so I think that they are changing they are now putting more buffer into their timelines when they talk about new vehicles and talk about things like that now, with things like software, it's very hard to predict because, you know, let's say you come up with the full self-driving update and you try it and it's just bad, right? It mm -hmm. is just has too many issues. Well, you got to go back and fix it, you know. So mm -hmm. software is software, uh, but they're, they're doing okay on that. And with the hardware and production timelines, they've really started putting more buffer and trying to set expectations low. And some of their claims sound so absurd and so crazy that, you know, for example, 56% range increase that people just assume it's just the same old Elon, you know, getting mm -hmm. excited and then the reality ends up being a little tough. Mm -hmm. But there is a couple of things that make me think the Model Y, Shanghai, um, these sorts of things where Tesla's actually under promising and over delivering. Yeah. So with the batteries and other things, it's exciting to see kind of how that ends up as yeah. well. Yeah, I think like one of the like reasons why I think with their factories and kind of especially with let's say Shanghai, right? They were able to ramp quicker, um, roll out let's say the standard range, roll out the possibly the Model Y in Shanghai mm -hmm. will probably roll out faster than they're they're saying. Um, yeah. maybe even by the end of the year, they're supposed to be next year. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of this stuff actually helps kind of protect their current sales if they can kind of have a delayed timeline and then surprise right. people to bring it up a little. Quicker, right. Right. And so it kind of makes mm -hmm. sense. Like the strategy yeah. makes sense to, you know, sandbag a bit, the timeline, mm -hmm. protect your pro current products a bit more. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree. Like Tesla's like, it's surprising. It's like almost a different company in some ways, you know, the buffer, mm -hmm. the, the execution, it's like, um, right. Yeah. During the model three ramp, it just seemed like, oh my gosh, like just, oh, <laughs> you know, problem yeah. after problem and stuff. And, and then something happened where it's just like, okay, we fixed it. And now we're, you know, just on a different mm -hmm. trajectory, a different path. It feels like. Definitely. I think there's a lot of smart people at the company, you know, Jerome Guillen, he deserves a lot of credit. He's really right. the guy who saved Tesla, um, with his, with the manufacturing and all that. And they brought a lot of smart people in who are working very hard and believe in what they're doing. Um, and it is a very different company. Any startup that's producing a small number of cars is very different from a company that's mass producing products for, 
you know, hundreds of thousands, soon millions of people every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Who do you think is uh, Tesla's biggest competitor going forward? Hmm. Well, you know, there's no company that competes with everything Tesla does. There are companies that compete with parts of what Tesla does. Who's their biggest competitor in electric vehicles? Probably a Chinese company. We don't know which one yet, but they, you know, and a lot of the, them, like, for example, Xpeng will just mm-hmm. copy Tesla. So in electric vehicles, I think, you know, I would look at China. Um, big, you know, it's just a world above what's going on in the United States uh, in terms of the number of companies producing electric vehicle designs there. In terms of autonomy, it's probably Mobileye, which is owned by Intel. Um, They're the only other company that is taking a computer vision-based approach, which I think has the possible, I mean, you've seen computer learning and deep learning beat the best go players in the world beat the best you know chess mm-hmm. players in the world do tasks that only a human can do and these techniques are just naturally evolving very quickly so i think companies that bet on that trend will do well um, rather than l- relying on expensive hardware and specialized cars which are hard to produce in large numbers um, in terms of batteries um i suppose lg and cattle um, will be their competitors long term. I mean, can Tesla really produce a cell that's better than the smartest battery companies in the world? It seems unbelievable, but this is what they claim they're going to do. And of course, they're still going to buy from Cattle and LG and all these other players as well. So maybe they're kind of hedging their bets there a little bit um, and honoring their uh, supply contracts. But, you know, that's the really interesting thing is there's lots of great companies in all of these individual areas but what makes tesla unique is tying these things in together and vertically integrating them where they're saying you know i'm not just going to make the best battery cell i'm going to modify the structural design of the vehicle to be the battery pack to achieve the greatest efficiency from top to bottom and uh yeah Mm -hmm. yeah got it Huh, awesome, man. Um, yeah, thanks for chatting, man. Appreciate the time. Yeah, yeah anytime. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, I love just uh, just connecting and just talking. I mean, a lot of times, like, just like, you know, people to are just trying to get the essence of what Tessa's doing. You know, it's like, it's, um, it's fascinating, you know? It's like one of the most really fascinating is. companies, changes in the world that's going on. It's just like, and to see the, the amount of confusion around it, too. You know, and um, it's just like, wow, so, so interesting to be part of it. Definitely. It's really fascinating. I think that it's not just even about Tesla. When you look at all these other companies, so many of them, whether it's an EV company, a car company, an autonomy company, Mm -hmm. they're all just racing to respond to the environment that Tesla has created. Mm -hmm. Um, And this transition to electric vehicles that now every company is doing right i mean every company has to have some answer to what tesla has has demonstrated um and you know it really is going to change every i mean you think about the entire global economy it's powered by cars and fossil fuels Mm -hmm. to do anything to buy anything this is the infrastructure underpinning our whole economy and it's all about to transition and everyone's going to be affected. So it's definitely a really crazy story. And I think that's why so many people are so hooked. It's yeah. very Apple-like in many ways yeah. with the introduction of the computer. Yeah, definitely, man. All right. Omar, take care, bro. We'll see you around. Yeah. Thanks for chatting. Take it easy. Talk all to right, you man. later. You all right. Bye.